Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hypnosis for Permanent Weight Loss podcast. And today I have a really awesome guest. I'm so excited to have her, Juliet Tangen. And for multiple reasons, I'm really excited to have her. Um, it's kind of strange the way that we got connected. Juliet probably has no idea either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for some reason, Juliet, you just ended up as a Facebook friend of mine. And I don't really spend mm. that time on Facebook. Um, and I don't, yeah, I just don't. But then mm. you know, the Facebook lives and all those videos that pop up, you know, to watch or whatever, for whatever reason, like I started watching yours. And I was like, who is this girl? She's amazing. Cause, you know, one of the top values is full blown self expression, right? Just like stream of mm. consciousness, leadership, like letting all parts of yourself be seen and heard, right? As, mm. Especially as far as, you know, people being on their pathway to healing and getting, you know, to the next place in their life or being able to make a difference in the world. And it's just like, yep, the way you communicate, the way you show up in all those ways just completely resonated with me and totally appreciate everything that you're saying. Um, and then as I kept watching more and more of your stuff and more and more of your videos, I was like, okay, I want to help this girl out. You have the most amazing story I've ever heard, right? I don't even know how to do <laughs> But appreciate that. something, yeah, and we're going to get into your story and I appreciate you sharing it because it's actually super apropos right now. So with my clients and doing the hypnosis for permanent weight loss, a lot of the reason why people are stuck in dieting and weight loss and exercising and obsessing about their bodies and weight and all that stuff all the time is because they have emotional traumas from the past, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that's emotional trauma that's huge or it's emotional trauma, you know, by way of how society would define it or emotional trauma that's, you know, mom pushed me off her lap when I was five and I made it mean that nobody likes me anymore, right? Doesn't yeah. matter when those things are happening in the background, people are staying stuck. Right. And something mm. coming up actually for a lot of my clients is they're starting to email me because I have a group coaching program. And, um, you know, the whole thing is like share whatever is happening, share your shame, and then the healing can happen after that. Um, mm. And some of them are emailing me in private and they're like, I, I have this sexual trauma from my past. I can't talk about it. Right. So mm. even today on my group coaching call, I was like, I need to make an announcement. Like one out of three people, I'm pretty sure are the statistics, like have had some sort of sexual trauma or mm -hmm. in the past. And part of the reason that we're staying stuck as a society is because we're not able to even talk about that. So mm -hmm. um, with your story, Julia, and you're being willing, you know, to share about your story, which is, you know, the big T trauma as far as I'm concerned and hopefully anybody is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, I think is just a testament to what's possible when you're number one, willing to share. And then mm. number two, willing to not let those stories or disempowering beliefs that get stuck in your brain because of that kind of stuff, hold you back from just being successful, being of service and going after any area of your life that you really care about. So just thank you so much for sharing all of that and for being that and for being an inspiration to not only my people, but so many more people. And mm. yeah, and and I'm just really excited to have this conversation today. And my intention is to really support you with what you're up to because I'm excited for everybody to know what your mission is because of your story, which is just so beautiful and amazing. So thank you for being here. Yeah. And I wouldn't mind starting by sharing like your story since we're talking about that. I think that would be really helpful to hear. Yeah. Um, first of all, wow, that was like such an amazing mm -hmm. intro. Um, I really appreciate all the kind words you said. Um, yeah, so to answer your question about my story, um, when I was born, I was left on a doorstep um, and I was like a couple of months old, they say. I mean, there's not a whole lot of like records as far as like exactly how old I was, um, but the, the doorstep that they left me on was a foster home and you would think like naturally like, oh, that's lucky. You didn't get left on like any doorstep. You got left on a foster home. That's great for you. Um, unfortunately, the foster home where I grew up was more or less a camp that was uh, using women that were old enough to get a foster license. And they were using those women to uh, get children into this camp so that they could exploit and, and rape and abuse these kids. And so for the first six years of my life, um, I grew up in this camp where um, the, the sexual abuse is just like beyond description. Um, I think I, I always get hesitant to talk about this part because in, in one people's in most people's minds, they've seen like sexual assault on TV and they see it as like one very specific way. And, it's never good on TV, but it's never quite an accurate description of what it's really like. And 
um, how I grew up in my in my childhood was much gorier, much mm, more gruesome, and much more. I would say like borderline torture driven rather than just like your what you would think or what the media d depicts it as. Um, so I lived like that for a really long time. I grew up with three other foster siblings, but ultimately we had a lot of other kids in this camp. So they had like several other houses um, in that area, all of which had the same like foster care uh, type, you know, um, title. And they would get these kids on a constant basis. And the, the just kids would come in and um, they would grow up till they turn 18. And then these girls and boys, once they turned 18, were so brainwashed and so traumatized from the torture. I'm talking like people being cut open level of torture and abuse that they've had their whole life. They're so brainwashed by this point that they um, kind of just do whatever these camp leaders say to do. So then they become foster parents and then they get their own kids and then they kind of like repeat the cycle of abuse to, to further generations. Um, and I was lucky enough to get adopted. This is something that most kids um, that grow up in the foster care, most of them never get adopted. Most kids that are sexually abused, no one ever even finds out about it until years later, till they're adults, unfortunately. Um, it's very rare to hear a story of a child that was like actually rescued, but I'm lucky enough to say that I was. Um, when I was six years old, I was adopted by a single woman and she was fucking amazing. You know, like I, I moved in with her and she had uh, three other kids at the time and they're a lot older. The closest one in age is seven years. And uh, so she lived with us for a couple of years, but the rest of them are like 16 and like 20 years older. So I wasn't super close with my siblings just due to like age. But um, yes, yeah, so after I was adopted, I lived with her and um, this new family who I now, anytime I say my mom, this is who I mean. Anytime I say my family, this is who I mean. And I grew up with them. Um, as you can imagine, it was quite a transition, right? So people would naturally think that, oh, you're adopted. So you went on and you were happy. But really, um, the process of adoption, whether or not you were abused beforehand is in and of itself traumatic. So going from like one living scenario to another, to people that you've never met before, um, and you have no idea where you're going, you have no idea what's going to happen to you. And you're like stuck in the back of a car and someone's like, your life is going to be so great. And you're like sitting there like, dear God, someone's about to murder me. Like, I'm like, you, like you have no idea. Um, but obviously that didn't happen. It was, it was a great home. Um, I was lucky enough also the state, uh, apparently I had so many issues that they paid for my therapy. So um, I was able to get the mental health support that I needed to overcome my trauma. Um, an example of how bad the trauma was, was uh, my mom got married uh, to this guy when I was like nine or 10. So just a couple years after I was adopted. And uh, she was like off at work and he was like home mowing the lawn. Now I didn't like this guy, but somewhere uh in my brain even though i had been through therapy like i was still very brainwashed and i remember she was like off at work and he was like mowing the lawn and i don't know why i did this but uh, i just got like naked and i went and laid on his bed and i waited for him to come inside and that was because my brain was just programmed to believe that that's what my job was that that's what was supposed to happen when there are men around and even when there are women um, so he obviously came in and was like appalled, right? He's like, he's totally not like a dude like that. Right. So he's just like, oh my God, they just got married too. So my mom, he was like panicking. He's like, how do I explain this? Mm -hmm. Um, he called my mom and, uh, that was, I think the first time my mom really realized that I had been traumatized. Um, up until that point, I think I was not like the best kid, but I think I hit it pretty well. Like, I don't think anyone really knew the, the level. Um, so yeah, she, she threw me back into like really intensive therapy after that. And um, I was able to overcome a lot of my trauma and a lot of my issues. I would say not all of them to this day. I still got some quote unquote side effects, but um, yeah. And then right before I turned 15, my mom actually passed away really suddenly. So at this point she had been divorced. The siblings had moved out. I wasn't close to any of my extended family. Um, and so she just, she just died and I had nowhere really to go. I had nothing to do. And um, I bounced around from house to house. I stayed with a friend and aunt for about a year. Um, 
And I remember at one point, I just like kept thinking to myself at the last house I was at, I was like, I'm like, I know I was only 16 at the time, but I was like, I'm, I'm too fucking old for this shit. Like, I'm like, I'm like lived with seven or, um, eight families at that time. And I was just like, so tired of moving. Every family has new rules. Every family has new expectations. Some of them had different religions. So I was like converting religions every couple months. And it was like, I was just so over it. And my mom raised me to be very independent. So I grew up even after she passed away, like I knew I could do it. Like I knew I could be more. I knew I was going to be wealthy. I knew I was going to start a business. I knew I was destined for more, but the houses that I was ending up in after she died, like just wanted me to like go to college and live a normal life. And, and I was like, look, man, like, I'm not destined to be normal. Have you heard my story? Like, I'm not a normal kid. I'm not going to live a normal life. So um, I found a legal loophole. I moved out on my own into a very crappy apartment when I was 16 and got a job. And um, one day I woke up eight months into that job, hated that job, quit it. I had no online business at that time. Um, but then I quit my job and I went online to Google how to make money online. And I literally just Googled it until I found an article that made sense to me. And I followed that article, didn't make a dime for like seven months. Like literally no one would even pay me $20 on Upwork. Um, until one day, um, some person reached out to me on LinkedIn and it was a company from France and they needed someone who spoke both French and English and they hired me. And then the rest is history, right? So I, I got hired for that job and, um, that transition to more clients and more clients and more clients. And before I knew it, I was uh, quite successful by the time I was 20 and um, just kept doing it until now. And then now I guess the rest of my story is I most recently started a charity and it's called we rescue kids. And now I'm helping rescue kids that have been sexually abused, just like my mother rescued me. So that's what I do with my life. <laughs> and to be clear for everybody, a million dollars by the time you were 20, which was your goal. You said that. <laughs> it was, it was my goal. Yeah. I remember I, I set that goal because right before um, my mom died, she actually like, uh, she, I don't want to get too morbid, but she like kind of knew or felt like she knew she was going to die. So she started like coaching me on like, when I'm gone, this is what you're going to do. So we were talking about like life goals one day and I was like, yeah, I want to be on Forbes 30 under 30. And the reason why is because my brother was like a, I won't put in air quotes in case he watches this, but we're not close. So fuck it. Um, he's an entrepreneur, right? And he hit the regional 40 under 40, but it was like really regional small newspaper. And my mom was just like lit up proud. And I remember that day, it was like several years before she had passed away. And I was like, well, I want my mom to be like that proud of me. So I was like, what's more impressive than a regional 40 under 40? Forbes, which is world renowned, 30 under 30. So I told her one day, I was like, I'm going to be on third Forbes 30 under 30. And I was like, well, what's what's going to get me on that list? And I was like, I bet if I became a millionaire by the time I was 20, I'd be on the list. And I did become a millionaire by the time I was 20, but I'm still not on the list. So All right. Whatever. Well, we're going to get you on the list. That's the I tried. <laughs> hey, going after the goal is the whole thing. No, absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing your story. There's so many things, you know, and takeaways from that. But I think you know, something that we work on a lot in the hypnosis for permanent weight loss program is understanding the subconscious, right? And so mm -hmm. where most people get stuck is that they are feeling ashamed, you know, from their past, like we were talking about in the beginning of the call, like I can't share my story, right? Mm -hmm. And you just stay stuck in the disempowering beliefs versus having that understanding that, you know, we're all masterpieces, like we're all whole and complete right in this moment. And we're all a work in progress at the same time. So you mm -hmm. know, scientifically understanding that the first zero to about eight years of your life, which it sounds like was the year that you were adopted, right? Is six. Yeah. Six. Okay. Yeah. That the mm -hmm. blueprint of the subconscious mind is laid out, right? Mm -hmm. and that equals like 95% of the results that you're getting in your life. You know, like mm -hmm. this is good. This is bad. Like getting naked and taking my clothes off for a man is normal, right? It's just like mm -hmm. automatic habits and patterns, right? So mm -hmm. when people actually get that, you know, regardless of what the automatic pattern and habit is, you know, you might feel anger and then you start stress eating food, right? It's like, mm. like, oh, we just get immediately mad at ourselves and shame ourselves for having this bad behavior before we even give ourselves permission to, first of all, mm. it, second of all, look at it, you know, what is happening mm. here and giving yourself permission to be a human being and mm. anger, 
you know? So again, like, just thank you so much for being, you know, that brave person who's willing to say whatever you got to say and know <laughs> it doesn't mean anything about you. The fact that you did that, you know, mm. it was absolutely amazing. And something else that I see is, you know, the people who have the most success in my experience, you know, of people that I've met in my life are the ones who have experienced that tremendous, you know, hardship in one way, shape or form. Right. And they have chosen to not be a victim of it, but rather, you know, make lemonade out of lemons, you know, and like mm -hmm. the fact that you are directly translating now into your mission of the We Rescue Kids, right, to be able to raise that money and start that. I mean, that is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm curious, can you share a little bit more about, you know, what you guys are up to and what your intention is for that, obviously, other than rescuing kids that are, you know, sex trafficked, which is. Awesome. Yeah. So it it's it kind of ties perfectly into what you guys talk a, a lot about on here, um, which is a lot to do with trauma and overcoming kind of like that brainwashing. So um, our charity is called We Rescue Kids, and obviously has two primary functions, which is actually three. Number one is to rescue a child that has been uh, sexually abused. Number two is to place that child into what we call a safe home. But that safe home is not just a place for this kid to live because that would just be a standard foster home and we don't want to be that. This safe home um, is staffed with uh, highly certified trauma um, uh, therapists. It's staffed with a bunch of people that can help these kids overcome their trauma, overcome their brainwashing. Um, and more than that, like just learn how to thrive and be happy and, and really realize your own potential. So. Uh, then once that child has gone through that program, which is usually at least six months, but this is oftentimes, unfortunately, mandated by the government. So if that if the government says that child qualifies, then we will place that child into our uh, adoption service where um, hopefully that child will go on to be adopted and find a long term loving home. For the kids that don't qualify, which again is not what I don't get to control that, unfortunately, um, otherwise they'd all be adopted. But for the kids that don't qualify for that, they will go on and they'll probably live with us until they turn 18, um, which, you know, is not ideal, but it is a lot better than A, continuing to suffer and be sexually abused or B, um, live in silence and have to. Uh, never process that and, and kind of like live in pain, emotional pain for the rest of your life because of the trauma that you've been through. So um, our primary focus right now is opening up our first safe home. In this safe home, uh, we need to raise about $150,000 in order to open this safe home. I think we're about 40% of the way there so far. And we just started fundraising a couple weeks ago. Um, and this first safe home is going to be housed for six to 10 kids. And these kids, like I said, are going to come in, but they're going to be um, able to be children, but they're going to get the mental, emotional, and physical. Also, sometimes they have physical ailments due to the level of, of torture or trauma that they've been through um, and, and overcome that and, and be kids and be happy. And so we want to open our first safe home by the end of 2020. And by after that, we just want to pop up safe homes um, everywhere. We want hundreds of safe homes probably in every major city across America. Um, just in San Diego alone, where I'm based, is like over a $3 billion underground sex trafficking industry just in my city. So that just shows you guys like how massive this problem is as far as people or children being sex trafficked and sexually abused. And I think the biggest misconception about that is that this is a third world country problem. This is like only in Africa or only in India or only in Mexico do people get trafficked or, or sexually abused. But in reality, a lot of foster homes that are abusing kids are like your neighbor, but they just live like a, a blue collar lifestyle. They have like a regular house in suburbia and you don't know what's going on behind those doors, but they, they oftentimes are abusing those kids. And it's not just foster homes, it's like everyday families are, are abusing their kids, teachers, churches, everything. So uh, the the primary objective is just raising awareness about this, how big of a problem it is. I mean, $3 billion for one city is massive. And, and that's not, we're not even that big of a city. So it's a massive issue. Our goal is to open our first safe home in San Diego by the end of the year um, and start rescuing and, and helping these kids rehabilitate. 
100%. Yeah. And we're definitely going to make sure everybody has the link all over their places to be able to donate and yeah, absolutely calling people to take action in that. And I'm personally super grateful that I have something that I feel 100% called to take action on and be able to support mm-hmm. that mission because it's something I really care about. Um, yeah. And I'm curious because you were talking about the traumas and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, right, for you to be able to mm-hmm. make this amazing lemonade out of lemons, right? Like, what mm-hmm. were the things that you did, you know, maybe some of the emotional mastery support or whatever, the inner work, whatever that you had to do that helped you the most to get out of that place? That is such a wonderful question. And I feel like I'm not going to deliver the answer that you want, but I'm going to try. Um, I've tried pretty much every form of traditional therapy. I've done talk therapy, behavioral therapy, hypnosis. Um, I did medication, which is standard for for kids, right? They just like medicate you and send you on your way. Um, As a kid, those are like the primary things that I did. I honestly can't say that it's, it's hard to say because when I was adopted, I had a lot of behavioral issues. Like I was a very sexual kid. I like just didn't have an understanding of like normal society. And obviously that stopped after a couple of years. So obviously to some level it worked, but the therapy that I got as a child, I don't feel like in hindsight, that therapist, I think broke a lot of HIPAA laws. And this was like wildly, I wouldn't say she's a bad therapist. She just like the line was super gray between like therapist and like family friend. And it was just like, not, it, it was just weird. Um, so I don't know necessarily the, th- the therapy helped me break that those behaviors uh, in terms of the trauma and in terms of like the emotional, like feeling like I'm worthy, man. I mean, I, I don't even know if I've overcome that one yet. I think the biggest one was my mom. It wasn't even therapy. It was just like having love. It was just someone who every single day was just like, I love you. You got this. Like, we're going to make this happen. You're the smartest kid. She'd always like, you should be like, you're my, you're my best kid, you know, which is totally bullshit. But, uh, you know, she would tell me these things to, to make me believe in myself and give me that confidence. Um, but truth be told, like after I was an adult, I probably stopped going to therapy right around 16. I was diagnosed with Adderall, like the second I was adopted and I took medication from like eight to like 13 and I stopped taking it right around the beginning of high school just because I didn't like what it did to my personality and um, it just made me kind of a zombie. So I quit medication and my mom died. So my insurance didn't cover therapy. So I wasn't in therapy from 16 until like eight, 19 or so. Um, And by this time I had already moved to San Diego, like who was living my life. And I was in this relationship where my best friends would say it was like emotionally abusive. I don't want to say it, but it's probably true, unfortunately. But I was in this relationship where it was just like off and on, back and forth. And I think relationships was the thing that made me realize the most about myself and like just broke me, right? Like this man just like tore, well, let me rephrase it. I allowed this man to tear me apart and make me feel worthless and make me feel things that I hadn't ever really confronted before because I think for me I'm a really tough person and I felt a certain level of confidence and I just started this business I was a millionaire like I was like rolling in it and I had confidence until I dated this guy and then that's when all of these feelings of like I'm not worthy started to come up that I never realized that I didn't feel before and it's not his fault um I allowed this relationship to make me feel these ways but uh that's when I I started going to therapy again in San Diego and we did talk therapy we did emdr which people swear by personally i don't know that that necessarily works for me um mostly just because i'm add so i just found it like very way too difficult to like concentrate i mean i've done everything i've done even hypnosis i've done nlp i don't know 100 percent, but if i had to say <laughs> which I know this isn't the answer you're looking for, but if I had to say it's been my mom and my friends has been like the number one, like thing to help me overcome my self-worth issues is because I surround myself with other people that like have something that I want. Like my best friend, she's not super wealthy, but she's like a a happy, 
like just the fucking jolliest person you've ever met and she's like super self worthy and she's like confident and she always gets what she wants and like she's dating men that are beautiful and great in bed and i'm just like i want that because i was looking at the man i was dating and i was like i don't have any of that right um and i just surround myself with people that had that kind of like confidence and it made me realize that i don't and then i was like i I was surviving, but I was never really happy. And I was like, okay, I was wealthy. I was doing the work, but I was never really happy. And so just surrounding myself with those other people and, and really being humble enough to like go to my friends and be like, Hey man, like I, I feel like garbage on the inside. And I like, I've struggled with body image a lot as well, but just like going to my friends and being able to talk to that them has been the biggest changer for me. And I know that that's kind of like, contrary to most people's belief they'd like to be like i bought this course and it, it changed my life nothing no one thing really changed my life but except for the people in it oh, i love that no absolutely not. i so appreciate you sharing that and you know no answer that i'm looking for right obviously we do mm. this for permanent weight loss okay, good. <laughs> i am very very clear mm. right that it's the system of support right of being able to exactly what you just said like share the fact that you're having a hard time and feel like garbage right? Mm -hmm. Be able to be around other confident people. Every single coach that I've ever hired, it's because I look at them and I'm like, well, I want to be like that. So yep. let me surround myself with anything that person has going on. <laughs> and yep. I to level myself up and buy whatever it is that they have for support and be able to just ask them all my questions as things come up and as I'm growing towards whatever goal that they have accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. Be able to make it happen. In addition to you know the the tools and the hypnosis or the other stuff that can help train the brain to like look at things in a different way but when i have people come to me i have people come to me all the time that are like i've done hypnosis before and it's like totally okay like tell me about that experience right because mm -hmm. it's looking at it's like they just if you just go and sit in a chair and do some relaxing hypnosis like yes you'll <laughs> have done that a little bit of results right i've done that as mm -hmm. well right but without that consistency of going back and back again and the action taking, which I'm hearing you say that you continue to take action, right, at the same mm. time from a place of empowerment and worthiness, right? Even mm. if you're faking it till you make it, right? We're all doing that's it. true. The I did time. a lot of that, <laughs> 100. percent But that's like the courage and the bravery it takes, right? And it's like, in my experience, we learn to become that as we're taking actions, even when we're faking it, and then slowly, you know, or rapidly, who we become, you know, is someone mm. who is worthy and able to make that happen. So. I love that you're saying that, you know, so, you know, saying what's true, you know, having surrounding yourself with other people, taking action against, you know, what feels comfortable and okay anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And learning some tools along the way that can support you during the hard times, you know, that's what we're all about, you know, at Hypnosis for Earlier. So I love that you have had that experience mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're just kind of rinsing and repeating. And I think yeah. it's helpful for people to share. I mean, we've all, the five people you hang out with most is who you become. So mm -hmm. for you, for just being that warrior and making sure that you're surrounding yourself with awesome people that you can raise your vibration up to. That's amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And so for, you know, the people out there, because obviously your story is all the way over here, you know, and there's some people mm -hmm. way over here. Right. But it's like at the same time, we know that, you know, a big thing that I see people struggle with when you have conversations with them, body and stuff like that. And maybe I'll even ask you to share a little bit about your journey with that. Um, is that they don't feel like because they know that stories like you are out there, they don't feel like it's uh, a worthy enough thing to feel so bad about, right? Mm. Like, oh, this is such a petty problem to be like thinking about food and body and weight all the time. Like, I don't even want to share about that because it's so shameful. There's people who are being sex trafficked in the world. Like, I can't mm. talk about that, right? Which only makes the problem worse. Because what I say to people is like first world problems Right. That's the major issue is because we actually have the resources to be able to do missions like you're doing today. Right. Yep. But when our heads are completely closed off to that because we're so trying to manage the fact that we're thinking about these obsessive thoughts all the time, you can't be in service to the world. Right. Mm -hmm. My main thing is that for leaders and parents and people who are taking care of lots of people, right, in any way, shape, or form, that you are taking whatever trauma that you're having, whether it's big or small, seriously, right, and take care of that stuff, get out of your headspace so that you can get present and start being in service in the world and, you know, follow your passion and your calling. 
So anything that you feel like that you'd like to share to anybody who's in that space of feeling like, oh, my problem is nothing compared to Juliet's. Yeah, I mean, I this is a this is a tricky space because you you want to be careful not to enable people to play the victim. And I'm kind of a very hard edged, very blunt person. So um you, you want to make sure and by playing the victim, I don't mean like the woe is me. I mean, like playing the victim is allowing something bad to happen to you to affect you negatively. That's a choice. And that's playing the victim. Right. So I think that um, if you're in a space and you're feeling like you can't talk about your feelings or you feel like you can't talk about your trauma because it's not big quote unquote compared to someone else's well then you're you're more or less playing the victim to your own problems right because you're sitting there and you're like look my i i've got this going on but it's not bad enough and then that's just like it's allowing it to affect you negatively and, and at the end of the day everyone needs to realize that that's a choice how what happens to you not always a choice but how it affects you is 100 percent a choice and so I would I would say that, but then to to the more compassionate side of me would say, um, a lot of my friends have come to me over the years and said the same thing, like, hey man, you know, I've got like a lot of trauma or like things, but it's been very difficult for me to talk to you about it because I feel like it, it doesn't matter to you or like you'll judge me or like it's not that big of a deal. And and I mean, look, it's all about perspective. What's what's hard for me to go through might be like whatever to someone else to go through. And what's hard for you, who's ever listening to this to go through, uh, might be like whatever for someone else, but it doesn't matter because it's you and your life. And it, it coming from a place of like looking at other people's lives, like I can tell you one thing is like someone always has it harder than you. And that's coming from me. Like I've met people that have had things that like, I can't even wrap my head around the, the trauma that they've seen and the things that they've been through. Um, and they don't judge me because my trauma is not as bad as theirs. It's not a competition about whose trauma is worse or who's had a harder life. It's about like, I had something, whether you whether it was big or not. And like you said earlier, I had something that happened and then I made it mean this. And then I let it affect me like this. Um, it, it's all relative and it's all a personal experience, but you have to accept that like, it doesn't matter how big or small the item was, it's affecting you and you need to go after it and you need to target it and you need to fix it. I don't care if it's like, like you said, my mom didn't let me sit on her lap one time when I was five and that really hurt my feelings. Like if that's, if that's messing you up on the inside, man, like, like fix it. Like there's no judgment. It's just like, fix it. The only time that there would be space to for judgment in that and not really even then that's not the word i'm looking for so i excuse me for saying that but the only time there would be is is if you let that continue to affect you on an ongoing basis when you have the resources to overcome it if you're sitting in in, in america or any first world country and you have resources to overcome trauma which let me be honest every single one of you listen to this has some resource um then the only thing that matters is like whether or not you're going to do something about it. Uh, but it doesn't matter how big or small the trauma was. It, it just needs to be overcome. Oh my God. I couldn't, that's the most amazing way to say that best response that I could ever imagine. Absolutely. It's like no trauma is too big or too small, whatever you are waking up, you know, constantly thinking about and obsessing about that, stressing you out in the morning. Like I don't care yep. if it's the fact that you feel like you're fat and your clothes don't feel like if that's what's happening all day, you know, and you're going to bed at night and thinking like, mad at yourself because you didn't follow your diet plan and what like whatever that is you know or you're scared about your kids or whatever 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 is yep. taking over your mental space like take care of it you know take yep. action and exactly what you're saying there's no excuse today i always say like you can just youtube it there's millions of people out there. <laughs> amen <laughs> I have the same story happened to me and just you know follow them listen to the podcast i mean obviously everybody who's listening to this is already doing that so good for everybody who's listening to this right but then mm -hmm. something that is one of my main things that i talk about all the time on my podcast is like take action you have to ask for help you have to make a change you have to get out of your comfort zone like there's no other way right but it's like what's worse you know staying in the hell that you're in for the rest of your life believe mm -hmm. that it's not possible for you not be obsessing about whatever your headspace is obsessing about all day every day right? And possibly prevent your soul from being able to do what it's being called to do when that stuff is out of the way, right? Mm. Or experience some discomfort and face some of your fears and be scared, 
you know, mm. on a fairly regular basis until you can overcome that and then be in a whole different space, right? And get to deal with a whole different slew of problems and stresses. Yep. Let's be honest, being a human being is stressful and hard and whatever. But, you know, when you have that support and you start to change the way you're looking at it as like, like, wow, this means I'm alive. Like this stress means I'm alive. Like the alternative is being dead and depressed and not, you know, living at all. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for saying that. That's awesome. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so I know, you know, body image and, and that kind of stuff has been something that you've been working on. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that for us? Yeah. Um, when I was younger, it didn't hit me till I was like old, like, old, like comparatively. Most people, like you hear them, like since I was 10 years old, like I felt this way. I think when I was in fourth grade, one time I sat down on the desk and my squat, my thighs like squished out to like be really large. And I remember being like, I hope no one saw that, you know, and I just like got off the desk and like stood up. And I think there was like a half a second there because I would look at other girls and I'd be like, oh, they're so whatever. But for the most part, most of my teenage years, I, I felt pretty confident. I think I was I was I, I mean, I didn't really work out. I just was like genuinely blessed with like good body shape. And and so I felt pretty confident. I don't know exactly like what the trigger was, but I. I think it. I started working out when I was like 17, 18. So right before I moved to San Diego and I, I didn't feel bad about my body. I just wanted to like be healthier. And so I started working out and then I think something about that triggered this like self-conscious thing in me where it's like, I was working out to be healthy, but then I think I came so obsessed with it. Like I was like, um, I did really good. I lost, I, I didn't need to lose weight, but I, I gained the muscle that I wanted to gain. I got the body that I wanted to get, but I think I like became so obsessed with it. Like if I don't follow this routine, if I don't work out every day, like I'm going to be fat. And then I don't know how or why that happened. It just it came out of nowhere. Like a couple months into my working out where I realized I was like really starting to obsess over like my body. And I was like working out originally, not because I was self-conscious, just because I wanted to like feel better. And then it turned into this journey of like me obsessing over it. And then um, I I think the other catalyst for me, if I'm being honest, is probably Instagram. I was like, you know, all, my whole business is on social media in like the girls on there, which by the way, they're, it's all fake, it's all Photoshop. But to me, I didn't know that at the time. I was like, they look like that. Like I don't look like that. And I think I just started to like really, associate it like most women do like you're like okay she has like 10 million followers which is because people like her and they probably like her because all she does is post photos in a bikini and she's beautiful like let's get that straight she is beautiful and she deserves that but then i i looked at her and i compared it to myself and i was like i don't i don't i don't feel like that and then that was kind of that and then i i got into a relationship where he never made me feel ugly but i think he let me just be really honest, like the sex was not happening, like to the level that you would expect it to happen in our age group. Like it was not at all. And I've got a high sex drive, but even like with someone who has a low sex drive would be like appalled. And I'm talking like once every 10 days, if I begged him to have sex with me, you know what I mean? Like it was like, and I think that the, the fitness journey kind of becoming really obsessed with what I ate and how often I worked out combined with Instagram. And then the final catalyst for me was like the relationship where this man didn't want to have sex with me. And I went all the way back to my childhood where my only purpose was to be a sex object to men. And then here I was in a relationship and I was like, well, I can't fulfill this one thing that I was designed for, which is sex. Cause it was obviously still in my programming. And I really started to get very, aware and like think about my body just like you said like all the time what do i eat and how often am i working out and do i look like this and 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 like every like pretty much every hour or so like the thought would come into my mind about like how do i look and being fat and things like that and um honestly i'd say like i definitely still struggle with this to this day i think um now i've learned how to balance it a little bit better and uh it doesn't like debilitate me it never debilitated me it never stopped me from leaving my house which is i totally relate to your your target audience here because it it was something that i felt stupid for being self-conscious about and i was like no because like like i'm a pretty like i've always been a pretty fit person i don't say that to brag i just mean for context like 
my friends would be like, you look great and you're super fit. And, and, and so I felt stupid for being like, everyone thinks I look so great, but I felt like I looked like a big pile of a bag of rice is what I call myself. <laughs> Sometimes it's horrible. Don't copy that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I've struggled it and I, I honestly can't say that I've conquered it a hundred percent, but I've definitely learned like, how to manage working out, eating healthy, feeling good, and then just kind of realizing over the years how much of social media is fake has been the number one thing for me where it's like um, I've met some of these like influencers or gurus on Instagram and I've seen them in real life. And I'm not saying that they're not beautiful. They are beautiful, but they're not what their photos online say they are. Mm -hmm. So they're still beautiful, but they're just different. And when I started like meeting these people in real life, I'm talking people that have like 10 million followers. And I was like, um, I think I should like release attachment to trying to look like something that literally nobody on the face of the planet looks like, except for like athletes, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So that's, been, that's been, um, that's been my journey. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I, it's, it's probably really helpful to also know that, you know, someone who has done all these things by, you know, whatever age, right, is still dealing with that. And that's exactly what it is. Like, that was my story as well Was I started talking about it to friends in high school, right, just mm. a couple friends about my, you know, constantly thinking about that all the time. And like, completely, like, they couldn't understand me. Like, it was just like, what are you talking about? Like, there's this and there's that. So then I learned to quiet my mouth and not say anything because I was like, well, I don't want to embarrass myself anymore because clearly yeah. thinking isn't being validated. So therefore I must be crazy or something. Right. Or, or people think that you're like just doing it for attention. You're like, Oh, I'm fat just to like get a compliment. And it's like, I'm not trying to get a compliment. I, I genuinely think I look like shit. So yeah. <laughs> and it plagues my life. Like I'm thinking about mm -hmm. it 24 seven. I'm suffering. All the time. I did work with Dr. Joe Dispenza and he did a one time about um, uh, the three things that your brain can actually think of. Right. And the mm. only three things, one is the time, like I have to be here at this time or that time. Another one is the environment, like it's hot in here and it's cold in here. And the third mm. is your body and the way that you think that it feels right. Mm. Our minds are just left in a place of uh, idleness. Right. Mm. Those are the only three places that your brain can go. You know, yep. so we're not talking about this half as much as we need to be as far as I'm concerned as a society. Right. Like mm -hmm. imagine if Americans were out of their head. Right. Because we have we're so privileged that a lot of us do have so much time and space to be able mm -hmm. to be idle and, you know, hang out and whatever. But then we now have these new problems. Right. These first world problems of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff happening. And it does become an addiction in the brain. Right. Of thinking those negative thoughts all the time. And without us taking action on getting those things relieved and taken care of again, mm -hmm. you know, we're sitting down watching news and saying, oh my God, I have to do something about the sex trafficking, right? But are we actually taking action? No, because you're stuck in your brain. You know, mm -hmm. like get off your couch. Like, but this is why I'm such like a person of like, take care of your thing that's keeping you up at night or that you're thinking about all day. You know, yeah. we don't know what it is that you're gonna be taking action on, but it's gonna, you're gonna have space. You're gonna get clarity for yourself on what your purpose is, right? And maybe your life path, right? If I just continue to say to myself, like, oh, my story doesn't matter. I wouldn't be helping mm. hundreds of people today of going through my program and getting them to change their mindset and starting to take action on their life and changing their families and all that kind of stuff, right? I don't mm -hmm. have a story like you had, but if I bought into the story of my story isn't good enough or nobody needs that, right? Mm -hmm. This mission can't happen. So I yep. firmly believe that everybody has a mission. Everybody has a story, right? And it's until we start taking care of ourselves and expressing whatever that is, you know, and le learning how to love and accept yourself for the way that you are, that you can actually make a difference and also feel that fulfillment because you're doing something that's 100% in alignment with something you care about, which mm -hmm. I think makes the world a better place. So thank you for sharing. And I'm so happy that you're, because you're, you're working with somebody now that I heard, right, is making a difference for you. So um, I've always worked with personal traders mm -hmm. uh, throughout my life. So um, I'm just working with a, a personal trainer who I will plug his name is Luke Schumacher and he's the best like mm -hmm. legit his like whole philosophy is like man he okay he's hot like he is beautiful <laughs> and like I like I I mean like objectively speaking he's probably one of the hottest men I know in real life like here's like Zach Efron who I've never met and then here's like this guy right like he's like he's amazing and he 
has also dealt with like body shape issues, which to me, you know, I'm like, what the, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but his whole philosophy is like work out three times a week maximum and walk and basically he eats like Chipotle and whatever the hell he wants to eat, you know? Um, and so his whole philosophy. So I've been working with him for quite a while. And, and before him, it's just like personal trainer after personal trainer. And I do that mostly because if I work out alone, I don't do it as intensely. Um, I think, like I said earlier, the number one thing that's really helped me with the mindset stuff is my friend. So my friend, uh, she talks a lot about like dating. She's a dating coach. So she's all about that. And one of her segments is like how to date when you're plus size. Cause that's like one of her things. And, um, and, and I, one time, like it took me 18 months of friendship, like, and we're best friends. Right. And it took me a long time. And I was like, do you ever feel self-conscious about the way you look? Cause she's like so confident. Like I've never seen her even like blink, you know? And I'm like in my room and she lived with me for a little bit uh, during COVID. And I'm like in my room, like not very often, but I'll catch myself like once every three to six months and I'll just see my reflection and cry, you know, like it's horrible. Mm -hmm. But I think other women go through that. And so I just went to her one day and I was like, I don't like, do you ever like feel self-conscious? And that was the first time she ever told me out loud. She's like, yeah, almost every day. But I just like get up out of bed and I realize what a the queen I am and I and I move on with my day. You know, she's like mm -hmm. uh really cool. So I think that the thing that's really helped me overcome it, as I said earlier, is just surrounding myself with people that have something that I want, whether that's they have the money I want, they have the life I want, the the family I want, the the confidence, like my friend, she really inspires me in terms of like confidence and dating and things like that. So just surrounding myself with people in different areas that have what I want has been like the biggest thing that's helped me overcome that. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I really have this belief that, you know, that in order for people to avoid, right, that mm. scary, scary feeling of gaining weight, right. Mm -hmm. you will actually like add all of these things to their life, like just to distract them. You know, yep. and it's like when you get to the foundation, you know, place of like what is happening for that person, it's like this death fear of gaining weight, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it's just like people, like we don't talk about that, but it's huge, right? Because the fear of mm -hmm. abandonment comes up. If I gain weight, you know, my parents are going to reject me. I won't be sexually attracted anymore. I won't be able to attract my mate, you know, my partner in life, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned relationships and I think it's awesome. I also have a belief that you know, will attract in these certain relationships that force us to have to heal these wounds from the past, you know? I agree with that, yeah. People and like, but when we choose to lean in and actually like get present to the fact that, you know, and it's like, we can't not be attracted to this person even though we might know that they're bad for us, right? And it's like, <laughs> okay, well, I guess I gotta go towards this, right? But those people will reflect back to us the relationship that we have with ourselves, even if we don't know that we have that kind of toxic relationship with ourselves. Right. We mm. don't know the war zone that's sometimes going on in our head. So then when we start to kind of reframe it and say, you know, how is this happening for me? You know, mm. lean in and seek all the lessons that you can to at least be able to get out of it and then attract somebody else that's, a, you know, in a healthier place for us. I think relationships are like one of the best places a person can go to be able to, you know, heal some of those things. And I think it's necessary, especially as leaders. And I'm curious for you as being a leader and a business owner, like, I would imagine you would agree with me that, you know, you have to take care of those parts of yourself and make sure you have your own support in order to be able to show up for other people. Would you say? Uh, I typically, I would say, yes, I think like, I'm not the, I'm not the one to follow for that one because I'm kind of like the anomaly who has like a, a very scary ability to put my head down and ignore everything else and like get this shit done so like business was my self-worth for a really long time and my bank account was my self-worth so i think for me like it was the opposite like i didn't need any of that stuff because i was like just on my bank account increasing and like that was like feeding this like idea of like i'm worthy and i'm capable and and I think that's also how I, I told myself, like, I was worth something more than just sex is I was like, well, now I also have money, you know, and it was like, which is total bullshit. But um, I think I'm, I kind of just put my head down and, and probably replaced it. Maybe you're right. Maybe I did. I probably uh, replaced a lot of that that stuff with with business and it paid off financially. But then in the long run, I'll tell you this last year, 2020 has been like. Uh, a massive year in terms of like growth and just realizing like I have a lot of money and, and I'm not really happy and I don't really like my life and I am doing a lot of changes because of that one of which is starting this charity um, for these kids because that's something that brings me joy but um, yeah I think t on a typical note like yes you do absolutely 100% don't copy me. <laughs> <laughs> 
or you can, you know, because I also believe that our level of consciousness, right, mm -hmm. at whatever stage that we are in the game, right? So it's like if you knew of any different way or if your your awareness had any indicator, right, that mm -hmm. you were that you were building this business out of self-worth, you know, because mm -hmm. not equal. I don't think I don't believe that you thought that as you were doing it. But maybe No, it's yeah, you're right. It didn't hit me until like yeah. years later. When like mm -hmm. it, like I had a few businesses and like one of them went bankrupt and it wasn't even a business I ran. Like I own like 5% of it. So it wasn't really technically my fault, but I remember I was just like, it really hit me internally. And I was like, God, what if all of them go bankrupt? And then I was like, God, I'll be poor. And then what, you know, like I was like, and, and not that there's anything wrong with being poor, like not financially um, wealthy, but it, for me, that was like my worst fear. So I think you're right. Like it didn't hit me until like years later where I really realized that I, I used business to um, create like this false sense of self-worth. Mm -hmm. And it, and honestly, 2020 has been like the first year that I've like really started to fix it. Like I've known it for a couple of years now, but I think 2020 is the year that I finally got the courage to do something about it. Like I ended that relationship last year, last fall, and then I restructured my company. And then most recently I started this charity. And most recently I cut back like, 80% of my clients for the rest of the year, which was like really hard for me because, you know, you're giving up that money. And for me, money has been a big thing and a big motivator. And I've always used my money for good. So it's not like I live like this, like massively lavish lifestyle. Like I'm literally filming this at a cabin in the woods that I think was like 60 bucks a night. You know, like, it's not like, I don't live this lavish lifestyle. I've almost donated the majority of what I've made. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been quite a journey of this year of just kind of like realizing that I, need to not only get myself worth from within, but I need to, like you said, take action on it. And one of those things was like, I don't, like, I, I don't want to do what I'm doing right now business wise or like what I was with these specific clients. Like I, everyone has those like few clients that were just kind of like, eh, I don't know. I don't really like you, but I do it anyways type of thing. And I just went to them and I was like, it's not that I didn't like them. It's just the project wasn't working for anyone involved. And we all just kind of pretended like it was. And, Anyways, I won't go into that, but long story short, like this is the first year that I've really taken action on it to overcome that that false sense that money equals self-worth or a good body equals self-worth. It's so amazing. And thank you for being willing to share that again. Because um, mm -hmm. that's the thing is like, at you know, we don't know when, you know, but at certain points, like you might wake up to those different things, you know? And, mm -hmm. you know, I have clients who will come to me and they'll be like, you know, like I didn't realize this until I'm 60 or 50 or whatever. And like, but it's like, yes, but your consciousness just woke up to this now, you know, like, how can you have faith and trust like that everything that you did up to this point, including every diet under the sun, and you know, you did hypnosis, and you did NLP, and you did therapy, like, you needed to do all of that to get to exactly where you are on your path today. Right. Yep. And, and we can't, you know, it's like, and that's, you know, leaning into the faith of like, okay, wherever my focus and attention is at this moment is exactly what I'm meant to do. And then if I'm woken up to something else because of a conversation I have or a relationship that I get in or something, it's like, okay, then I have, then I have new awarenesses then, you know, basically mm. mastering the present moment and just trusting every single step of the way. So thank you for being brave. And I think that that path is never ending, you know, mm. especially as service providers and business owners, it's like, we are constantly having to face ourselves in the face, you know, and mm -hmm. the hard stuff all the time. And I think it's the fastest way to personal growth and development if you choose to see it that way. Otherwise, in my I think it'd be a very hard and awful road to be on. <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. Without that kind of support and knowing, you know, the self awarenesses that come along with owning a business, um, it can be very hard or or raising a family or, you know, being a leader in an organization or anything else. So Yep. Thank you for walking the walk and showing the world that there is no such thing as, you know, somebody who doesn't have things that they still, you know, ghosts in the closet. What's the expression? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they no, I, no, I know what you mean. I mean, I really like I've got a lot of things wrong with me. But one thing I really pride myself on is like just I'm really open and honest about it. And I think that's why like a lot of people want me on their podcast is because like, I'm just really raw. Like, I'm not going to paint this rosy picture. If there's not a rosy picture, I'll tell you like straight up exactly what it is. And I mean, I, I don't want to leave like on a negative note. I, here's what I would say is like, I have accomplished a lot and I'm very grateful. But as you said, like we all have things that we still struggle with. And I think social media, uh, whether it just be like regular everyday social media or business specifically, 
uh, paints these very rosy pictures of what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like to be a woman, what it's like to like live your life. And, and none of it's really real. And I just want to be like someone, and I imagine you do too, that just like paints the reality of it and, and allows people to, to feel comfortable with being who they want to be, even if it's not what social media tells them that they want to be or should be. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yep. No comparisons. Everybody's on their own path. Trust your inner intuition. Anyway. Learn how to use it if you don't know how. You know, mm -hmm. support, surround yourself with great people. Juliet, thank you so much. Any last yeah, thank you. that you would say to anybody watching? And obviously, we want you to tell us how we can donate to We Rescue Kids. Yeah, so you can literally just go to WeRescueKids.org and it has all the information about the organization there and it has a link to donate. Um, another really great thing is if you aren't quite ready to donate to this charity yet or you maybe feel like you don't have the finances, uh, we're always looking for people to help us share the message. So little things like literally sharing one of our posts or just telling your friends about it or just any little thing like that where you think like, oh, this isn't going to make a big difference. It really does and it, it makes a big difference. And I think what's most important about all of this is it's about the kids, right? So it's like, let's remember that sharing this allows more people to see it. And the more people see it, more people donate. And the more money we have, the more kids we can rescue and the more kids we can help. And maybe, think about it this way, maybe these kids that have been horribly sexually abused, now they can get placed into our safe home and get the trauma they need. And they don't have to deal with some of the obstacles that we have growing up because they are actually going to be able to overcome it. Unlike a lot of us who had to suffer and take 20 years, sometimes 50 years to like really realize our, our stuff, we're going to give these kids the resources to overcome it right away. And I think that maybe that puts it in perspective for people, but um, these kids really need our help. And I think um, they're the most vulnerable population on the face of the planet. They literally the only population that can't help themselves and, that, and that, that's kids and they need us. And I think um, it is our, our literally our human duty as adults, but specifically as entrepreneurs who have money and who have time and who have influence, but even just as humans to help these kids, even if they're not our own. And for anybody that agrees with that, whether you were sexually abused or you weren't sexually abused and you just like want to support kids because you understand that kids are the future and you understand that no child deserves to be uh, abused, no child deserves to be, you know, suffering in silence. Um, if you guys do want to support that mission, you can just do that at WeRescueKids.org. So amazing. Absolutely. And if those kids have any chance of because of the support that they're getting at such a young age to do half as much as you have done at this point, Juliet, then the world's going to be a better place. And to be perfectly honest, where our planet is at at this time, we need more leaders like you stepping up, <laughs> up sharing what's happening and yeah, making the world a better place in whatever way that you can. So definitely everybody listening, share, 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 donate. We rescue kids.org. And if you are ready to take action on your uh, constantly obsessing about food and dieting and exercises so you can create space for your mission in the world, uh, please email me at coachmeleslie at gmail.com. Or if you're watching this on Facebook, just pop us a message and we'll get back to you. Juliet, thank you so, so, so much. I hope we raised lots of money for you. I'm definitely donating lots of money for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Time. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye.